Hello everyone, my name is Allegra Integra. Welcome to my channel. Today I am going to be doing my June reading wrap up and I actually managed to read 10 books in June, which to me is really impressive. That I think is double what I read last month. So let's get right to it. That's a lot of books to talk about. The first book that I completed in June was Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead and this is by Olga Tokarczyk. I'm not very good at pronouncing Polish names, so I apologize. I did look it up beforehand, but I have 10 books to read about and the pronunciation left my brain. Um, so this is actually the Nobel Prize winner, winner for literature of 2020, I believe. And it is follows the story of a woman named Janina who lives in kind of like the boonies part of Poland, uh, butting up against the Czech Republic. Janina lives alone and she lives in a part of Poland that isn't usually occupied all year round. People might have summer houses there, but she's one of three people that lives there th year round. And the plot really kicks off when she and one of her neighbors discover the other neighbor who's there year round has died. Uh, it's kind of a weird mystery book, but it's actually more about what's going on in Yanina's head. She is a very obsessive person. She goes on really long tears about astrology and I like astrology as like a little minor hobby, but I don't know that much about it. I know enough to know that she's not a good astrologer, but she also is aware of that herself. And she's also obsessive about translating William Blake's poetry into Polish. I do want to give the translator a shout out. I believe this was translated by, why didn't I look, look at this before? Antonia Lloyd-Jones. I want to give the translator a shout out because a lot of this book is about perception and how um, the way that we perceive the world and the way that we communicate to the world is going to be very different depending on our life experiences and our beliefs. And there is a through line through this book of Yanina and her friend uh, translating William Blake's works. And it is done really artfully in the translation because they're talking about how do you translate English to Polish and maintain what Blake meant while also making it make sense in the Polish language. And I think being able to translate that in a way that made sense when you're translating this from Polish to English, but they're talking about the opposite um, is a really artful thing. And I just am really impressed with that in this translation that I had. Um, but overall, more about Yanina's character. Uh, she's very eccentric. She doesn't like being around other people. She's very specific about her beliefs and that really shines through in this book. So she reminded me a lot of uh, one of my family members. If you have read this book, you might think, well, that sounds really overwhelming. Well, it is. So Yanina is very single-minded. After her, the first person dies, his name is not Bigfoot, but she calls people by names that she thinks suits them better than their actual given names. Um, but when he dies, there is a rash of murders or a rash of deaths in their small community. And she is trying to convince the police to look into them because she believes that the animals are doing it. Yanina does not like hunters. She really hates poaching and she's a vegetarian and she's very staunch in those beliefs, just like she's staunch in her astrology and that she's very single-minded when she's translating Blake. She is distrustful of her community's police officers and authority figures, but she also still wants to communicate with them and let them know what she thinks about it. And she believes that the animals are committing the murders. Uh, the twist or the reveal in this book, I did eventually see it coming, but I struggled to really connect with this overall narrative. Uh, I think there was a lot going on in it. Maybe I'm just not smart enough for it. Uh, the stuff I did get out of it, I really enjoyed, but it was kind of difficult to read along with. I eventually did get the audiobook and read with it and that helped me not push through but it helped me comprehend things a little more but overall I did give this three stars because of that but if you are wanting to try a translated work and you like murder mysteries that don't necessarily revolve only about solving the mystery this might be a good book for you. The next book that I read in June was Severance. I'll pop the cover up here. This is by Ling Ma and it is very much like a millennial narrative. This book is about a pandemic uh, called Shen Fever, it's actually a fungal infection, that ultimately either kills you or leads you to kind of act out one of the last things that you did, uh, kind of like a zombie. But the zombies aren't 
violent and they aren't like seeking brains like a traditional zombie narrative. They just do repetitive motions of mundane tasks until they waste away and pass away. And then we follow a young woman named Candace who has just kind of been floating through life, both with her relationship and with her job that she chose. I talked about that part a little bit more in the vlog, but overall, I think this was just a really good example of millennial ennui. And I really enjoyed reading this until the end. The end was open-ended and I'm not against open endings. Sometimes they frustrate me and I, I am still thinking about this ending. I am still trying to figure out what exactly happened and I think that's actually the point. Um, I don't want to give spoilers in it, but it is an open ending that leads you to ask a couple questions about the infection, about the main character's choices. Overall, I did give this four stars. It was a really enjoyable read and I just, apparently there's a theme, you will see this later in this video. I was very into reading books about ennui and this one definitely hit certain points that the other ones did not. Next in June, I listened to the audiobook of Shrill, Notes from a Loud Woman by Lindy West. And of course I listened to the audiobook, that's a little redundant, but regardless, I think listening to Lindy read the audiobook herself really lent to it. Uh, it brought out the humor a bit more. Um, her humor is very biting. She looks at things in a very blunt way. Most of these essays really do focus on her navigating the world that she has decided to enter, such comedy, as a woman, and not just that, but as a fat woman. The most powerful essay to me is actually her talking about confronting her boss, Dan Savage, about his fat phobia while she was working at The Stranger. That takes a lot of guts. Um, I think I probably resonated with this in particular because I think it was four years ago, uh, Dan Savage actually blocked me on Twitter because I also called him out on some things and I find that hilarious because I'm a nobody. So clearly that's a unique experience that I have that would make me connect more with that essay. But overall, I think this was a really strong showing by Lindy West and I've already put at least two of her other works on my library waiting list. <laughs> Should probably say the star rating. I gave it four stars. Uh, there were a couple times I lost the thread in the essays. There were some that were weaker than others, so it wasn't an all time favorite, but I'm definitely interested in reading more of her works. Next, I read Sealed by Naomi Booth. This is another book that I read for my pandemic reading vlog. I, I didn't like this one as much as I like Severance. Overall, uh, I talk a lot more about the plot itself. Again, it's about a pandemic uh, in the vlog, but my overall feeling of it was the character development was kind of flat. It was a fast read. It was an enjoyable read. I think the body horror was really wonderful. Uh, which is a weird thing to say, but like I really enjoyed the way it was portrayed. It creeped me out. Uh, so it got the job done. But overall, even though it was short, I did a lot of the characters felt flat and several of them felt like stereotypes without exploring why. Uh, once I found out the author actually is from England and not Australia where the novel is set, it explained a little bit more about why some of these characters may be flat because it feels like she was basing them off of stereotypes as opposed to lived experience. Not saying you have to only write about your lived experience, but I'm not a big fan of writing about stereotypes, especially when we're talking about people in rural areas and countries that you aren't from. So I didn't love this, but it was enjoyable enough. It was kind of like a popcorn read, so I gave it three stars. Hmm. So this is controversial opinion time. The next book that I read in June was Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. And that was the final book that I read for my pandemic vlog. This is actually set in 1918 Ireland, and it follows the course of three days where we're following a nurse in a maternity ward, but it's specifically a maternity ward for women who have contracted the flu, which is an amazing premise. I also really enjoyed a lot of the writing. I liked how the book was separated into four parts that were actually the colors that someone is turning while they are becoming cyanotic, which you know ups the tension throughout the book. And I actually did enjoy how specific it was. It went into detail about some really harrowing aspects of childbirth. Not that I needed to necessarily hear that, but in 1918 in particular, you know, a hundred years ago, things were very, very different. It kind of got lost in that description sometimes, but the writing was done so well that I really enjoyed it. It could have been cut down, so that popped a star down for me. 
And there were a few things in the synopsis that were teased. For example, the, the doctor that we follow, who is a real person who sounds extremely interesting and was uh, monumentally important when we're talking about the troubles in Ireland. And she wasn't really in the book very much, except to kind of confirm the nurse's concerns about the male doctor's dismissal of women's problems or women's healthcare needs in the t at the time. So that was disappointing. But ultimately, there is a twist. And I am going to put, if you don't want spoilers, I have to talk about this, I'm so mad. Um, I'm gonna put spoilers up here and you can skip ahead. So the twist in this book, the drama twist, because I was told it was queer fiction and I'm like, okay, well the doctor character, who was a real queer person, I'm like, okay, maybe that's it because they reference her partner a few times and it's a, you know, hush hush, not explicit because of the time frame, which I was fine with until close to the end of the book when the nurse, Julia, Julie, connects with the young volunteer that she's been working with for the last few days and suddenly they're in love, they're both women, they're in love and they're kissing and they adore each other and it's all very chaste and beautiful. One, it came out of nowhere. I didn't feel any tension at all with these characters. It wasn't adorable or believable at all. And then the volunteer dies of the flu, which I had a feeling that this person was going to pass away because near, when she's introduced, she says, oh, I've had it already. And the nurse says, well, this one? She goes, I've already had it, instead of being specific about which flu she was talking about. But she passes away. And I understand that 1918 flu took young people very, very quickly. Like, I understand that. But it's 2021. This was written in 2018 and published in 2020. Bury your gaze is... Uh, what, there was no tension. It was like insta-love. They'd only known each other for two days at this point. There was some suggestion that Julie was a lesbian or was queer, but there wasn't a ton of suggestion that the other character was until it happens. It just felt cheap. And it felt like, I do not mind books that make you cry. I do not mind books that are supposed to make you cry, but I do not appreciate books that manipulate you in really gross and cheap ways. I did not like it. So I gave it two stars because the book was beautifully written, but there were a couple things that kind of bumped it down a little. And then at the very end, I just, I got extremely mad. But the beautiful writing salvaged it away from one star. Next up, I read Between You and These Bones by F.D. Soul. This is a poetry collection that I can't tell you a ton about because it wasn't very good. Uh, there are a couple points in this book that were really lovely. Um, so I do have it, I have it somewhere, but I didn't bring it up. Uh, but I have dog-eared a couple points in it, but I couldn't tell you any of them right now because it felt really generic. And while the, there were a couple phrases here and there that were beautiful, it felt like this wasn't very well edited. I just really struggled to remain fully engaged with this poetry collection. So for example, in Post-Colonial Love Poem by Natalie Diaz, while that's a relatively short collection, the poems themselves are not short. It, uh, many of them are several pages long, and I was captivated by the language, I was pulled in by the imagery, and it was just beautiful. This poetry collection is not quite the Instagram length poetry like Ruby Carr, but it's kind of a mix of medium and Instagram level and like Instagram sizes. The editing was strange because I couldn't always tell if a piece of a one of the small couplets was actually the end of a longer poem that came before it because the themes were kind of intertwined, but I just wasn't engaged and these were not long poems. It really felt unfinished. The meter, while I know that's not always required for poetry, sometimes it would start to hit a rhythm and then it would suddenly stop in the middle of a poem uh, and it would lose that pacing. So I just really didn't enjoy this. It was very forgettable. I ended up giving it two stars because some of those phrases were really gorgeous and I'll probably revisit it. But overall, this was a fail. The next two books that I read in June, I am going to present them kind of back to back, even though I did read a book in between them because these are sister books. I did not do that on purpose, uh, but these absolutely make sense to read together or closely if you're fans of either of these authors. And the first of those two is going to be My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshvig. I had not read any Otessa Moshvig before this. I was not really aware of what kind of author she was, but I did see Uncarly talk about this book in her video about 
if this is someone's favorite book, that's like a red flag. And it's one of her favorite books. So I thought that was an interesting way to pitch a book. And I also really liked the premise. Ultimately, what this is about is our unnamed narrator is wanting to sleep away a year. She has everything she's supposed to want. It's the year 2000. Everything is supposed to be going her way. She's a young, beautiful woman. And they talk about, she talks about that a lot, how pretty she is. <laughs> like she knows she's pretty. Uh, but she's this young, beautiful woman in New York City with a glamorous job and a glamorous degree and an older boyfriend who turns out to be a douchebag. Uh, surprise, surprise. But it's just, she's not happy. Her parents have recently died and she's just tired and all she wants to do is sleep and she decides if she sleeps for a year, then she will feel better. And she finds the world's worst psychiatrist, who is essentially just a drug dealer, to help her with that. And she's able to get a bunch of drugs that get her through her year of rest and relaxation. Uh, she's not actually asleep the whole time. Like, she does wake up um, to eat, to take care of herself a few times a day. She watches a lot of really bad movies, and she tries to be in a stupor during that time. I couldn't decide if I loved her or I hated this book, so I split the difference and gave it three stars because it's a really impressively strange but accurate portrayal of how depression can feel. When you feel like all you want to do is sleep and if you could just sleep for a while everything would be better. And a lot of people with depression, myself included, have avoidant tendencies when, when we, because dealing with your actual emotions is hard. I talk about this all the time at my job, I talk about this in my own therapy, I don't like it because it's uncomfortable and sleeping is one way that people can escape and this main character just takes it to an extreme. The reason that I sometimes hated it was the character is not likable and that's okay but almost to the point where I was like how can you still be so beautiful if you're abusing your body this way? How did you get a hold of this psychiatrist? How are you able to continue to get all of these pills? Why does your friend who only wants to complain about her own life, but she's got real problems too, still sticking around you? Like I get that that's the satirical part of it and that's the humorous part of it, but it almost pulled me out of the like really intense, boring, you know, interesting way portrayal of depression. Uh, so I ultimately gave this three stars, but I can't stop thinking about it. So I might have to bump it up to four. It is not a plot driven book. It is very much a portrait of avoidant depression and what does that look like if you have the means to indulge yourself. To follow that up, and I did not do this on purpose, I read Milk Fed by Melissa Broder, which is the story of a young woman in a glamorous city, this time in LA, who suffers from an eating disorder as opposed to depression, but she clearly has some depressive issues as well who is struggling with focusing on what her real issues are and how to manage them. So they're sister books. They're very different books. They're written very differently. This book, okay, first of all, major trigger warnings for depression uh, and self-destructive behavior. Nothing explicit like with self-harm, I guess taking the pills is self-harm, but she's not trying to die. But just trigger warnings for that, it made me pretty bummed out for like a week after I read it. <laughs> major, massive trigger warnings for eating disorder. Like, I was warned before I went into this, and I don't have a problem with that particular trigger, but this made me uncomfortable. Like, it's pretty rough. Uh, it has not made me feel as sad as its sister book did, but probably because it's just not something I personally deal with, while depression and I are old friends. But this book is gross, <laughs> and this book is weird. And it's funny in that really dark way where you're kind of like, why did I just laugh at that? And it follows a young woman named Rachel who is suffering from an eating disorder, works at a talent agency in LA, and has recently been told by her therapist that she should cut out her mother for 90 days because her mother is the root of a lot of her eating issues and is just not a very healthy person to be around. During this process of cutting her mother out, she meets another young woman named Miriam who is kind of her foil in every way. Miriam is an Orthodox Jewish woman. She's very dedicated to her religion. While Rachel was raised Jewish, she was raised Reform, and she, can, she considers herself lapsed. She does not practice any religion. And she, while she suffers from an eating disorder and is actually quite thin, Miriam is obese. And 
Rachel falls in love with Miriam. And there's a lot of conversations about food and about faith. There's the conversation about what's going on in Israel and Palestine, which was very uncomfortable and done really, really well because this book is supposed to make you uncomfortable. And conversations about what it means to be the adult child of a parent who didn't know how to parent you. And it's, it's a lot in not a very big book. Um, and I didn't think I liked it. I thought I was gonna give this two stars until the end. Some people have said in reviews, I like to watch reviews before I do my own because I'm not always very articulate, but some other people have said in reviews they didn't like the end, they thought it felt rushed. I liked the ending to this. I actually felt like the ending kind of wrapped up this part of Rachel's life. This is just a brief peek into her life when she's coming of age in her 20s as opposed to as a teenager. And there were a couple of things in the end that kind of made me go, oh, <laughs> about some of the own my own stuff that I've struggled with. As someone who tries to live up to specific expectations, maybe not weight expectations, but just other things, it was kind of like an epiphany about what this book is about at the end for me. Uh, that being said, it is really gross. The sex scenes in this are not described in a sexy way. Uh, they are kind of clinical. Um, the food eating can be really icky. Lots of weird sexual fantasies. Rachel is not likable, just like the unnamed narrator in the sister book. Uh, but I felt she was a little more relatable. Not that that's required. Most of us have thoughts that we're ashamed of. Most of us have ideas about ourselves or about the people around us that we don't want other people to know because we're human and whether they're intrusive or we just have some dark thoughts sometimes. That doesn't always get portrayed really well in books and this one goes there multiple times. Uh, so it's uncomfortable, but I really liked the type of uncomfortable that it made me. So that's Milk Fed by Melissa Broder and I gave this four stars. In between those two books, I read The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. This is the story of two gay enslaved men in Mississippi in the early to mid 1800s. Yeah, it would have been about the 1830s. Uh, and they are on a plantation and the other, the other enslaved people have had no issue with their relationship until one of them is trying to get in the good graces of the plantation owner and begins to preach the Christian gospel to the other slaves, to those who are enslaved by the person who owns the plantation. And it's a really beautiful read. It's really upsetting at times. There is absolutely a through line of magical realism or light fantasy. I don't even want to call it fantasy though because it's a reference to the religion and the gods and the ancestors that these people were not allowed to explore or that they were being turned away from. Uh, multiple characters, multiple female characters specifically, but multiple characters throughout the book see glimpses of hates or uh, their ancestors. And it's all portrayed as true. This is not something that like, oh, this is just like, it's a real thing that's happening. And it was this really beautifully done, almost to the point where it kind of got lost in itself. Uh, it is lyrical to the point of being confusing. Uh, I actually listened to the audiobook for this one because I couldn't figure out what was happening because I would be getting lost in how abstract some of the language was. I think I'm pretty smart, but it was just hard to focus. And it was really beautifully written, and if I would go over it again, I would understand what was said, but it kind of loses itself sometimes. There were also a lot of biblical references, some that I did get and some that I didn't, that did, the ones I understood, did add to the story. So this is not a book to go in and read casually. It's absolutely something that you savor. It's something that you read slowly. And it's something that if you're not familiar with that, you'll wanna look things up to kind of connect why the different abstract things that are happening in this chapter. But it's just a really beautiful story that interweaves so many different perspectives. We hear from the two young men themselves. We hear from many of the women who are taking care of them after they've been punished by this by the plantation owner. I want to say slave owner, but you can't own, you shouldn't, you can't really own people. And that's sort of, that's one of the narrative threads in this book. Uh, but you hear from the plantation owner, you hear from his wife, you hear from their son, 
it's a really intense interweaving of multiple stories. You hear the stories of individuals in Africa before they are taken away from their home and brought to the United States to be, what would become the United States, to be sold into slavery. It, and it's so beautiful and I keep saying that word. I'm getting lost because the lyricism confused me sometimes, but it was absolutely worth putting the effort in. If you like lyrical books, if this storyline sounds like it's something you'd be interested in reading, this is absolutely worth the work. I overall gave it four stars, just knocking one off because that lyricism got a little bit out of hand a few times, but overall it's a really beautiful piece of work that intertwines ideas of what is race and gender, how did the Western world impact and oppress people who had their own views of that before they were subjugated. It's just really hard to put into words. You should read it and put in the time for it. And last but not least, I read the nonfiction book, which I'm going to read off here because it's a long title, Bring the War Home, The White Power Movement and Paramilitary America by Kathleen Ballou. And it's what it says on the tin. This is a book that a nonfiction book that's extremely well researched that covers the rise of the white power movement, white nationalist movements, and paramilitary groups that are anti-government in the United States from the Vietnam War. And it's very much following like the impact of the Vietnam War specifically on these populations, on these groups, all the way up to the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, so yeah, a nice, fun, light read to end my very light, ennui-focused and sad narrative. Focus to June, it was a great month, okay? I apparently like to punish myself. Uh, it was extremely in-depth. This read like a textbook. So I can't recommend it for light reading. I do think the information in it was really important. When I first picked this book up, I thought it would be a bit broader in how those groups came to be because they absolutely existed before the Vietnam War, but this very much is a specific look at how the Vietnam War and then things like Waco and Ruby Ridge impacted and helped influence the leaders in these movements, uh, all the way up to the Oklahoma City bombing, like I said before. It's intense. Uh, while it reads like a textbook, it, so it's very dry, the information is very upsetting. I think that the chapter about white women's roles in these groups was so important and was probably the most gripping because I don't think that that's talked about very much in media conversations or even the academic conversations I've been able to participate in, whether that be via like lectures online or Twitter discourse, you know, the best place to learn in depth and nuanced things. But that doesn't get brought up enough and it doesn't get it doesn't get the attention that it needs to have. My phone died, so the angle is probably a little different. Sorry about that. What I was trying to say is it's very important that we know these stories about women's involvement because oftentimes white womanhood can be used as a weapon uh, when we're talking about racism. And I think it is just a really intriguing and really important part of this conversation that isn't had enough in other spaces. And for that chapter alone, I'm glad that I read this book. Because of its textbook style and its general like dryness, I did knock off a star. But this is something that I think, if you're wanting to understand more about why the movements in this country have come up the way that they have, this is kind of an essential piece of uh, piece of nonfiction to read for that. That's all that I read in June. Those were the 10 books. I've been talking for way too long. Um, hopefully I'll have as good a reading month in August and I will see you then. Bye.